Good morning. Dear uh, Minister Ola Borten Mo, uh, colleagues, friends, this is an important initiative. In several Nordic countries, as well as in the EU, several reports point to the challenges for young researchers in the social sciences and the humanities. And this seminar approaches uh, two overarching issues. First, over the last decades, challenge and mission-driven research has become increasingly important, and this tendency has made many beneficial effects. For instance, in, in establishing closer connections between private and public partners in, uh, or in uh, aiding to make research agendas more agile and flexible. However, this tendency may also be understood as an increasingly eclipsing, more uh, open-ended blue sky research. This is especially challenging, and some would say worrisome, within the SSH field. Second, academic career paths for young SSH researchers in the Nordic countries are under pressure from a range of sources. Such, uh, such pressure includes lack of sufficient research funding as well as the disconnect between an increasing number of temporary research positions and a stable or decreasing number of permanent academic positions. Seeking possible solutions to these problems. This initiative will ask how should the Nordic countries together meet the challenge of curiosity-driven basic research? In what ways can we ensure politically and financially that the SSH field become more robust and thriving? More broadly, what challenges, opportunities and risks does the future hold for young SSH researchers? How can we strengthen the SSH field in Nordic research and education? How can we be braver in collaborating between us? I am looking very much forward to hear the discussions and the comments today. And uh, this meeting, this seminar will be hosted and will be, uh, will be, uh, uh, the discussions will be hosted by Hilde Sandvik. But first and foremost, I would like to give the floor to, and the stage to our Minister of Higher Education and Research, Ola Bortenmo. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Dear uh, laureates, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I am uh, pleased to be here to get today, together with uh, you. You are excellent uh, role model models for the even younger generation of researchers, hopefully motivated by curiosity, persistence and precision. Some of the same key elements of curiosity driven basic research. Uh, young researchers are important when tackling the challenges of our time, be it in the digital or green transition, or ensuring continued trust in research and in society in general. Your work makes a difference. You are the most valuable part of Nordic research. And we need and value your experience. Before today's discussions, when it comes to young researchers' careers, I would just briefly address the, the elephant in the room, at least from a Norwegian perspective. As many of you know, the Research Council of Norway is currently in a serious financial state. To restore order, 
we made decisions that have not gone unnoticed. I am aware of your concerns. What impact will this have on future fundings? How will it affect, affect you, your work, your careers? It is uh, important for me to assure you that this government also in the future will ensure a high level of funding for research and innovation. This year, the Research Council will receive just short of 11 billion NOC for distribution, and it will be no less in the years to come. But because the Research Council have spent and promised more money than they had, we must spend some of the funds on stabilizing the financial situation. We are working uh, together with the Research Council to ensure that they, will, that they will do whatever is possible to ensure a soft landing for this very important sector, for the Norwegian society, and for you as young researchers. We are here today to discuss how we help along and develop the careers of young researchers in the Nordic countries, especially in social sciences and humanities. I will focus on three challenges that I see as stumbling blocks. The overuse, number one, the overuse of temporary employment, two, the need for cultural change, and three, career guidance. Let me start with temporary employment. My government is eager to see change. We aim to reduce the number of temporary positions. The use of temporary employment in research is way higher than in the rest of the workforce. It takes too long to get a permanent job. Embarking on a research career today is not for the faint-hearted. As the number of PhD graduates has increased across the world, the competition for permanent position, positions has become fierce. Too many scholars end up taking one temporary position after the other in academia. We are at risk of losing great minds and potential due to the uncertain working conditions. This is a key challenge for research, not just in Norway or the Nordics, but across Europe and the rest of the world. From the government, we track the development statistically and address it regularly with the institutions. We are revising the regulations and the law for academic staff to ensure they reflect the needs, they reflect the needs of the 21st century and more nuanced information of the drivers of temporary employment is needed. Therefore, we have a tender out for a project to examine the relationship between extern external funding and temporary employment. But we also need a cultural change among researchers themselves. We must acknowledge that not everyone embarking on a PhD or a postdoc will or shall continue in academia. We must counter a culture which, which is biased towards selling academia as the pri primary career path. The critical and curious minds of researchers are needed across all sectors of working life. Therefore, Graduate students need to be made aware of all the opportunities a research degree provides. The problem is systemic. It is time for cultural changes with regards to how we organize research and how, 
how we value the competence of researchers. But cultural change does not happen overnight. Spearheaded by the European Commission and organizations such as Universities Norway and the, uh, and the Federation of Finnish Learned so Societies, the ways in which we assess and evaluate researchers' competence are changing. We are gradually shifting from a publish or perish culture towards a more holistic view. This will likely help build the foundation for more sectoral mobility and enabling a more active use of research. Though this development is largely positive, it makes it challenging for young researchers to make well-informed career choices. Therefore, my last point, career guidance for PhD students are, and researchers must improve. Proper career guidance becomes increasingly important to combat the uncertainty. The University of Bergen has established the UEB, Fired Career Center for Early Stage Researchers, to ensure the students' pr proper career guidance. Lessons learned from the early days of the center might inspire further actions across national borders. I hope the roundtable discussions today on young researchers' careers in the Nordic countries will be fruitful. I want to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the young academies in the Nordic countries, inspired by the Young Academy of Sweden and the Danish Young Academy. We supported the establishment of the Young Academy of Norway when we were last in office. Organizations like these have enabled the voices of young researchers, voices of young researchers to be heard. Thank you also to the University of Bergen for hosting this event, showing relevant connections between the Nils Klim Prize and the Norwegian Presidency in the Nordic Council of Ministers. The Holberg Week offers a valuable meeting place for discussion and interaction between scholars from all the Nordic countries. This roundtable discussion is a great way to conclude the whole big week. I wish you all a most successful seminar. Thank you. Thank you to the minister. Uh, I, of course, I should have. Uh, it would have been wonderful if you could stay on here. Um, and I know that you all know that you should be here as the minister today because, I mean, lately we know that we have had titles, uh, headlines uh, in in international news media about the purge and the shock that entered into research society in Norway. Uh, and I was very happy to actually hear that it was addressed in the first uh, talk here. My name is Hilde Sonvik. I guess the reason why I am uh, chosen as a host today is that I run a radio show called uh, Norskin, Svenskin or Donskin, uh, which runs now in Norwegian, Swedish and Danish radio. So we actually talk about research policies from time to time as well in the Nordics. We are here in this fantastic Ola, uh, and I have to say it because I was present here yesterday uh, when the, the, laureate, uh, the laureates were here uh, to, to give their speeches. And I mean, if you, and I have to do it again, it's, it's of course always as uh, living in Bergen, we have to, to point out to the, to the differences. Uh, this Ola is surrounded by the world. It takes the world in. Uh, it has open windows, and we tend to say in Bergen that we love it that the world comes in, uh, and we are kind of looking out on the world. That's how we perceive ourselves, and we can, of course, discuss whether that, that is true or not. But when I listened to Sheila Yonasov yesterday, I thought what she was actually pointing towards is why is humanities and social sciences so very important today? 
um, we know what kind of world we live in. And I'm not sure whether this is, after a week of celebration, really celebration of the humanities and social sciences, I'm not sure whether this is the Nachspiel or whether it is the hangover day. Uh, we will have to see. Uh, but today we will really dive into the challenges of the Nordic young scholars, uh, researchers, and we will think about is there any ways to, to connect to each other in a better way, uh, what to do with what uh, Ola Bortenmoon just mentioned, uh, the career paths. Uh, and there are so many other questions we will dive into together with distinguished, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ranging from former Niels Klim winners uh, to research council, uh, and we will be discussing this through all, throughout the day. And it will be recorded, so if something is said here, we can keep people accountable for it later, just as you know. But I will, before talking more, and this was my talk of today, the rest of the day I will leave it to you to talk, but first, Margaret, you can come back here. And of course, I, I also, I'm very curious to hear if you heard something new from the minister and uh, what you thought about what he said. Uh, I think I should refrain from commenting on the situation in the Norwegian Research Council uh, and stick to, to the topic uh, today. And he, uh, he talked about the challenges of, of young researchers and uh, as uh, those challenges are, are well known to us, it has to do with the career paths, with uh, the, uh, the extreme competition when it comes to funding of, uh, of research and uh, also to protect, we are an all comprehensive university, so to co protect also and to ensure that we are able to uh, to have um, to to preserve uh, a large diversity of academic disciplines within the fields of humanities and social sciences is also one of our yeah, challenges, at least when you have an institutional or national perspective uh, on that. I would also like to take this opportunity to say some words and to give some, maybe to start out giving some facts and figures about the situation when it comes to, to uh, as regards to the um, postdocs and the PhDs in, in Norway, and, uh, the, uh, and also when it comes to international recruitment. As the uh, um, minister just uh, mentioned, we are very proud to be, I think we are, are we the only Norwegian university still to have a career center for young researchers? Are we the only one? I think so. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that's not a good thing, of course, but it's, we are, uh, I'm very proud that we have managed to, to, to establish this career uh, center, which is called UIB Ferd. And it, they have been working now for, they have been open for just for three months, but they still have, they already have some experiences to share with us. Um, and uh, they have, uh, among the topics that the young researchers bring forward in their consultation hours with, within, in the Career Center, uh, approximately one third deals with the career, uh, academic career, uh, one third about sector mobility, and, uh, and, and the last third deals about yeah, work-life balance, which is also a big issue because we know that, yeah, fortunately, there are women among these also that m might also uh, try to, to uh, yeah, to get, um, have a private life and maybe have children also, so that's also an issue when it comes to, to the requirement of being, yeah, of m mobility, etc. UIB Ferd, this career center, often hears that the candidates get to know 
things during their, this consultation that I did not know they should know, both about their academic careers and also about the sector of mobility. And independent research work can also end, as we know, in lonely research. Uh, the Career Center seeks also to strengthen awareness about career development and about uh, uh, and uh, uh, avoiding loneliness and uh, uh, and increasing collaboration among the, these uh, young researchers. UIB Farid has taken the initiative for a Nordic collaboration with universities in the Nordic region to promote good tools and offers for young researchers and UIB wants to collaborate with Nordic partners because we face the common challenges and believe that together we can find good innovative offers for solid, uh, solid career development for younger researchers. Nordic language is important for the SSH and UIB actively participates in programs such as Nord Plus where the Nordic community is strengthened and Nordic as a professional language is also emphasized. No, and I would like to give you some numbers, some facts and figures. Now, there are eight times as many international doctoral students as there were 20 years ago. Eight times as many. In the last five years, more than 3,000 foreign nationals have defended their dissertations at Norwegian institutions. That is more than 600 annually. And the proportion of foreign doctoral students now amounts to among yeah, more than 40%. While it was just 10% in the beginning of uh, the uh, 2000s. In the last year, 28% of foreign doctoral students have a background from, in the last five years, 25% of foreign doctoral students have a background from Asia and Western and Southern Europe, respectively. The number uh, with an Asian background have leveled off somewhat, while there is an increase in doctoral students with a European background among us. Another significant change concerns doctoral students from the Nordic countries and Eastern Europe. 20 years ago, every fifth foreign doctoral student came from neighboring countries. Every fifth. While today, it's only the case of an every tenth, one to ten, candidate. In 2016 to 2020, um, 125 Swedes obtained doctoral degrees in, in Norway, 91 Danes, Germany had 302, and China 251 candidates. This is just to give you an idea. Citizens of Eastern Europe currently make up 15% of foreign uh, doctoral students, which means doubling the proportion in, this, uh, in the same uh, period. And among those who held, uh, who held a uh, postdoctoral position in 2014, uh, 2015, close to 60% were at an educational or research institution three years after. Only 3% of those have become professors today. And I'm talking about 2014-15. Only 3% have become professors today, while 15% now holds a position as associate professors. So, one in five was a researcher in the institute sector, and 
had a new postdoctoral position or another at another institution in Norway. This facts and figures, maybe I hope that you were able to capture some of them, I don't know with many, many numbers, it's not to problemize or to, I don't want to start a discussion about when it comes to international recruitment, but I think it's important when we talk about Nordic collaboration also to uh, understand uh, who are we talking about. Uh, in, in this seminar on how should we enhance Nordic uh, collaboration, also be aware of, I think, the situation or, or the picture that I'm, I'm giving now, it is not that different in, in Sweden or in, in Denmark. I haven't the numbers and the figures from Denmark or Sweden, but I think they are also as international as we are, uh, and um, that they have the, the same uh, challenges. So, uh, on, on that note, I would just... Um, uh, I would give the floor again to Hilde. Please, Hilde. Thank you. And yeah. yeah, and it was very interesting. And I have to say, and the reason why I have, have here now, because it, uh, we're going to jump directly into a panel discussion here. But I just want to mention that Margaret, I think I I, I try to dive into this, but uh, I think you are the only, except from an Agder University uh, rector. Uh, with humanities as the background, and that is quite interesting, I think, because all the other universities in the Nordic, if I haven't uh, missed something here, uh, mostly come from so, uh, sciences or na uh, natural sciences or whatever. It's, yeah, so that is also very interesting. But now I will get a chair up here, I've heard, and I will ca call upon a very interesting uh, panel uh, and with a lot of prize winners, I have to say. Uh, I will now call up uh, Daria um, Griskanko from uh, Helsinki, University of Helsinki. She was uh, Nils Klim laureate in 2021, so that was last year. And you have to come up here now. Did you get a celebration last year properly? We had a celebration at the Norwegian Embassy yeah. in, in Helsinki. But you were not here. I was not oh. here. Nobody was here. Wonderful. So you should go actually up here now having a speech. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the wonderful thing. Yeah, you, can, you can sit down. Thank you. And I will call up uh, Terry Lundahl, uh, who was... Uh, he was Lim, uh, Nils Klim laureate back in 2014. But you are also uh, a representative uh, of... E no, you are not. You are head of the NOSHS Norforsk. That is your, yeah, that's what you are now as well. And Hilde Reinertsen, representative from the Young Ac Academy of Norway and research at the Center of Technology, Inno Innovation and Culture. And now I have a chair here because we're going to say hello also to, to a fourth panelist uh, here. Uh, which we will now see on the screen, I think, soon. Do we have uh, Karina Keskitalo? Hi, Karina. Do you see us? Can you see us I from? Do. Hi. I do see you and I hear you fine. So oh, thank that's you so much wonderful. for having me. And apologies for not being able to be on site. You are excused. You are excused. It's in the middle of a, it's a hard time being a professor these days, isn't it? By the end of a semester. Yeah. So, but it's, it's great to have you here. And um, I just want to, to, before we enter into these questions that we have, uh, that we are going to talk about here, I just also want to hear your first response on what has been said so far. For instance, the numbers we got now from, uh, from, uh, from Margaret about uh, the mobility, it was kind of, it was interesting. But Hilde, will you start uh, your career when you listen to what's been said so far? What's your first comments? 
Uh, I think perhaps my first comment is that everyone seems to agree on what, is the what are the challenges. But at the same time, um, I think it's very important that we have events like this, where young researchers are actually uh, the ones who, who are uh, been, yeah, being, talking about this topic, because quite often it's the, it's the rectorates, it's the research council, the ministers, uh, uh, so I think it's important that we have this uh, occasion where also the younger voices are, uh, are being heard. And I've been in several um, settings and meetings where, where it turns out that the, sort of the, the senior uh, uh, level in the, in the academic world uh, has, has experienced a very different uh, academic life than, than, than the younger researchers. So it's a different world uh, that we live in now and that we are facing. So our landscape is different. Mm. Uh, so even though everyone seems to see the challenges, the, the, the solutions uh, are, are hard to, to find. It's like this Gordian knot <laughs> that mm. someone needs to, to help us slice yeah. through. Yeah. Uh, we often get the response of, yes, it's, this is very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult, uh, and I hope that maybe this panel can help sort of open up this yeah. to a more uh, constructive. Because we, we, this was, will be the first panel, and what I'm thinking about is that it also gives kind of this, uh, the, uh, the, it gives uh, ammunition to the next panel. So the, in a way, this is also kind, of, it's, it's a live think tank on uh, how young researchers actually experience today. But Tarja, you listen to, to Margaret and to Ola Bottomo, your reactions? Well, I think the numbers that we, uh, that we saw are very interesting, but there's another number which is equally interesting, which is that the number of PhDs in this country has really increased massively mm. over the past 20 years. Mm. So we now have many, many more uh, candidates, um, and they all need jobs, and, and I like the emphasis of the minister on, um, you know, general um, skills and the fact that we need to ensure that our candidates are well equipped for an academic career, but we also need to make sure that they're equipped for a non-academic career or a non-researcher career, mm. uh, as it were. So I think that's a responsibility that institutions also need to, to address yes. more. Mm. Daria. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, my first reaction is that I come from Finland and uh, I've heard now a lot about uh, Norway. But uh, you could basically substitute Norway for Finland mm -hmm. and you would pretty much arrive at the same speech and pretty much the same numbers <laughs> and same trends, right? So in a way, it's also um, something that we should acknowledge. I guess our challenges in the Nordics mm. are quite similar. Mm. Um, and it will be very interesting to see whether our responses Will be similar or not yeah yeah because we do sometimes have uh, different responses to similar challenges mm, as for example the recent uh, infamous virus yeah. showed us um, so one more thing that I wanted to say is uh, we also have uh, at the University of Helsinki quite uh, good research and follow-up on what our graduates are actually doing and I couldn't say so strictly for PhDs, but what I know for master's students, and this is also indicative, I think, of, of the general trend, uh, if we take the SSH fields, our graduates take slightly longer to mm. transition to the job market, but we do not see actually a situation where we would have severe long-term unemployment mm. among our graduates. Uh, and I have heard somewhere, it's maybe not the, the latest information, that uh, specific uh, PhD graduates from uh, natural sciences sometimes have more troubles uh, transitioning into industry careers or into you know, non-academic careers than SSH mm. graduates, because SSH graduates are just uh, maybe trained in a broader manner. And recently there have been a few projects at the European level where the University of Helsinki has also been a part, which is pretty much dealing with um, better understanding and communication of the skills, of the assets, as mm. they call it, mm. that social science and humanities um, scholars have mm. and the self-awareness is probably the first step towards um, 
uh, realization of certain kind of aspirations. This is not to say another thing. I, it, it's just my intuition, it's my hunch. I don't have data for this. And as a social scientist, I'm always a bit wary to say something that I don't have data for. <laughs> but, but bear with my intuition. I have a feeling that if people are serious about the research, if they want to do a PhD, they actually do want to have a research career. Mm. And there can be a reason for them transitioning slower to the job market just because they really want to try their mm. best mm. to actually stay in academia, to find a way to do their dream job. Yeah, so you go like zigzagging instead of like this... Uh, right. Yeah. Right, and this, is, and this is not something we can blame anyone mm. for, right? I have been in the same position. Yeah. I have been trying and trying and trying more. I have been lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Other people have not been so lucky as me. Mm. <laughs> it's very interesting, and I will, I will remember what you said about uh, the different solutions, because that's one of the most fantastic things, uh, being in the Nordics, that we are similar, but the yet so different. Mm. Uh, and that is why perhaps that's what something we will talk about later on, I know. Uh, and Karina, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't say that you were also a Nils Klim winner, so I'm sorry for that, because there is another laureate coming up here from, uh, from Umo. Uh, did you listen in to the conversations before here? Did yes, you listen? indeed, I listened. Hmm. Did I listened in, and I can comment similar to what people have said. Mm. At sight, you know, I think the situation is fairly similar in, in Sweden. Mm. Um, and maybe, I mean, I've been working with the resources union also in Sweden, but what I will say are my own comments and not, not specific union comments. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've been starting to think, you know, the reason why we recruit so many international um, PhD students and postdocs, maybe this is also because, in you know, honesty, and I speak based on a Swedish example, uh, maybe the research careers actually aren't uh, that attractive, yeah. at least maybe in Sweden. Uh, I mean, I know they are more attractive in Norway. I know your permanent positions actually seem to be permanent. But I mean, even as a professor uh, at a university, mm. I am supposed to put in some of my own funding. Mm. And to my mind, this is a crucial issue around academic funding. Yeah. I think if people are aware of these type of mm. issues, they might not actually go into a research career. They can see that you know, short-term funding for a PhD and a postdoc, maybe even two postdocs could be acceptable, but continuing for the rest of your life in this way. Can, uh, can I just... I it's not to deal with around basic funding, for instance. The, uh, there is something with the sound here that we, we can, is that something we can fix? Uh, because uh, uh, I think I heard what you said. Uh, and if you talked about what we also were talking about yesterday, it is, yeah, so you nod. And then I think I understood what you said, because it was also about these differences here, that even in, in Sweden, you, are, you sit as a professor at Umeå, Umeå University, but still you have to, to find your own money for your, paying your own, uh, what you, you are paid for, you, you, you have to, 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 to apply for fundings and uh, all the time, even to have a, a something on your bank account every month. Uh, but there is something here with the sound that, is that uh, uh, something we can do about that? Because, no, it's not. So, uh, that means that we have to be very, uh, perhaps you need to talk very slowly in order to us, for us to, to hear correctly what, what is being said here. But we can, we can jump into to the issues that you, we were about to talk about today. And that is, uh, you have gotten three questions and they're all noted in the program. And in order to, to, to remember them correctly, um, which supportive frameworks are needed to enable excellent research for young scholars in the Nordic countries? I know that you have some news to come here with, uh, Tarje. Do you want to start? Yeah, I, I would be delighted to start. Um, yeah, so you mentioned initially that I, uh, I have the privilege of chairing what is called, and I have to read this out because it's, it doesn't have the most uh, transparent name, uh, the Joint Committee for Nordic Research Councils in the Humanities and Social Sciences, what is typically called NOSHS. And this is a cooperation between all the Nordic <laughs> Research Councils uh, in Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, 
which are responsible for research in the humanities and social sciences. And this has now become what is called a program committee at Nordforsk, uh, which is an organization just underneath the Nordic Council of Ministers, which provides funding and facilitates Nordic cooperation on research and research infrastructure. And in our committee, uh, an important goal is to consider how to best realize what is called Nordic added value. So what is unique about working in the Nordic context and how can we exploit that uh, as best as possible, especially in the context of the humanities and social sciences. And we have been especially concerned about what we can do for young researchers. Um, and for many years, as probably many know here, uh, we've had what has been called exploratory workshops. Mm. Uh, and I know some of you have, um, at least Aria has, has organized that. Uh, and that has been a small level funding uh, for having workshops in three different countries, and you need to be three different Nordic countries to start new collaboration. And um, that has been a success. We've evaluated it and it works very well, but we also wanted to see if we could do something larger, something bigger, more substantial. And becoming part of Nordforsk also opened additional funding possibilities. So I'm uh, really excited to be able to announce a new project mm -hmm. call that will be out in the early fall uh, for bottom-up curiosity-driven research within the humanities and social sciences. Mm -hmm. We've been able to find 45 million krona uh, to do this. This is not gigantic, but it's mm -hmm. something. And many of us in the humanities do and social sciences do research that is not so expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, each project can be up to 8 million krona. And this uh, call specifically aims to provide an opportunity for early career researchers, so two to seven years after your PhD, to build Nordic networks and promote Nordic added value in research. Mm. And you need to be, have partners for four different countries, so it's really about the Nordic countries coming together uh, and, uh, and creating new and exciting knowledge. So this call, there will be a pre-announcement that's online on Nordforce websites later today, and then the call will be out later with a deadline in November. So we really hope that the Nordic researchers will start thinking about ways of exploiting this call and that it will provide some additional infrastructure uh, for young uh, researchers in the Nordic context. Yeah, because we are sitting in the Nordics and uh, we, well, we, there, is a, there is a map on today's program and we are missing out on Greenland. Did you see that? Greenland is not there, and it's still part of the Nordics as long uh, as far as I'm. And it's concerned. part of this. Uh, it's scheme. part of this yeah. scheme. Good. Yeah, and I, I'm just uh, curious to also to to hear you say something about. You told you said something about added value, but what is the added value in the Nordics? I mean. Well, Nordforsk has two ways of thinking about that. One is that there's an added value of just doing it in the Nordic context itself mm. uh, because we have a shared history and a shared cultural um, bonding in a sense. Uh, but another aspect, of course, is that because we're in the Nordic countries, we have uh, data that don't exist elsewhere. We have resources, we have topics, languages uh, that you can't use uh, or research as well as we can elsewhere. So you can both do research that's unique to the Nordic context and just the fact of being in the Nordic mm -hmm. countries with our shared history and so on uh, provides an edge. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the added value that we can exploit more because many of us tend to think or tend to look to the US or to Europe, mm -hmm. but there's also a huge advantage mm -hmm. just looking into our backyard. I mean, when you listen to Margaret and she says that, I mean, some years back, one of five students or PhD students in, in, in Norway were from the neighboring countries, and now it's one out of 10. Why? What do you, what do you think, Gertaria? Well, I think it's a sign that research is becoming ever international. Mm. So it's really becoming one global community and we're attracting uh, candidates from many mm. uh, different countries. Mm. Uh, it's a competitive game. Many of uh, the students from Asia, for example, are extremely uh, clever, mm. very skilled uh, in their fields. So I think it's, it's part of that. Uh, but it might also be a sign that we're not succeeding in attracting Nordic students to pursue research mm -hmm. and, um, and innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm concerned that we're not, in, in Norway and probably not in the other countries, able to attract the best minds to go into research. Mm -hmm. So it's fine that not everyone should go into research, but mm -hmm. we really depend on the brightest and best people to go into mm -hmm. research. And I worry that we, in the Nordic context, are not succeeding, mm -hmm. in part because there are so many other choices, mm -hmm. uh, but also maybe because we haven't made you know, the research career visible and, and mm. uh, attractive enough. 
Daria, what's your perspective? Right, I actually wanted to comment on even two things yeah. uh, and, and pick, up, pick it up from here. So one was with regard to um, funding. Mm -hmm. And the point I want to make is that uh, when we're, because you asked what's the value add for the Nordics, mm -hmm. right? And uh, this is definitely a good question, but at the same time, I personally have a bit of a problem of uh, thinking of research in terms of cost benefit. Mm. I think that cost benefit analysis is maybe not the best way to evaluate research projects because cost benefit analysis presupposes that um, we can quite accurately mm. estimate mm. the costs and the benefits and it, uh, it, it we kind of act on a promise that we can reach better resource allocation if we do so as if that would be known. Mm. And the, the funding bodies, what they are basically doing, they ask us to uh, outline our research idea, but then also to do two things. Mm. One is to outline our budget, which mm. is the cost. Mm. And the second thing is to outline our impact, mm. which is supposed to be the benefit. Mm. So the research idea is not just there because it's a good idea. It also has the dimension of cost and benefit that are supposed to be explicitly outlined and then somehow weighed against uh, each other to see whether this kind of benefit mm. really exceeds the cost. Mm. Uh, and all this is only possible uh, if you think that this can even be estimated or known. But this is not the case with uh, basic research, with curiosity-driven research. This is really brings us all into this very narrow framework of here are the taxpayer, euros, kronas, whatever, what, are you, uh, what, what do you get for it? But what... But what then I, I just want to ask this, the same question to you. Which supportive frameworks are needed to enable excellent research for young scholars in the Nordic countries? Well, I think another point that Eri made very nicely is that our research is actually not hugely expensive. Mm. For most of us, we don't need, you know, colliders and very expensive infrastructures. Mm. Uh, and it's surprising how much you can do with how little. But at the same time, if you look, many grant instruments are humongous. They are great. They are very large grants that require uh, pulling a lot of resources, a lot of administration, I think more lightweight instruments, mm. more things that are small but do allow you to go that mm. extra that you are exactly missing mm. from your own you know, time and resources that would be actually enormously beneficial. And this is exactly these exploratory workshops. Mm. Mm. This is just a, a brilliant example of how with 30, 40,000 euros, you can bring together 15, 20 people, produce a lot of output, generate a lot of ideas, mm. Uh, mm. And, and do a lot with actually fairly little. Hilda, you, you... Yeah, I, I completely yeah. agree. I think that is one of the key things maybe that we, for young researchers, we need uh, the predictability from sort of the, on, the, on the big scale, <laughs> that there are, uh, there are some, uh, that we know the landscape that we are moving through in a sense that is not shifting <laughs> mm. under our feet uh, in terms of the, that there are positions available with the transparent uh, hiring processes and that there are funding schemes that are uh, solid and, and stable uh, and that you have these big, <laughs> big grants, obviously, mm. that are, are fantastic for, for enable and independence and and uh, autonomy, but at the same time, this, we need this plurality. You need this big, the ERC and the Free Peru and similar, you know, the, the individual grants, but you also need this sort of communal or collective uh, instruments that brings people together. So the, the, this uh, exploratory workshop, for example, is a great example of that. Or, or other, in, in Norway, we have this Young CAS, uh, the Center of um, uh, Advanced uh, Studies, which and essentially is to bring together uh, a new group of, of scholars. And, and just to add to the, the Nordic aspect is that one thing is, as you say, the, the Nordic in itself is, is valuable to, to study and the, the contrast and the comparisons between the Nordic countries is in itself sort of extremely valuable and important. Yeah, but but can I just you, add? Yeah, mm. because you have had 
a great experience mm. on that, and I want you to, to say something about it as well, but just yeah. continue yeah, with your and then, uh, Because yeah. we, we talked about this, uh, this mm. uh, yesterday, and that uh, one thing is uh, sort of the empirical interest, obviously, but there's also for young scholars, I think it's, it's uh, accessible, or it's, it's, kind of, it's uh, um, realistic, <laughs> it's doable to have uh, the Nordic collaboration. It makes, makes you, it's international, it's, uh, it's beyond your, sort of your own uh, your country, your institution, uh, you, you expand your field, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of this light foot way of, of being, uh, having uh, your, your first uh, independent group or your mm. first independent project, mm. uh, where you can then, uh, as in my experience, I, I'm uh, uh, leading a project where we have partners in Sweden and Denmark and also in the US, but it's the Nordic uh, associations that are sort of the most important on a daily basis. And we, uh, we can more easily meet, it's easier to adapt to family life, <laughs> which is uh, uh, not just for women, but also men have small children, obviously. <laughs> So this is kind of the, the this is a situation that most are in. We're establishing our careers and our families at the same time, mm -hmm. and doing that within the Nordic setting is uh, is extremely uh, rewarding and valuable. And you need this, the polarity of, of small grants, which can then bring people together and have a give us um, time to to think together, to work together, uh, write together, and just have this. Uh, as, uh, <laughs> to paraphrase uh, Virginia Woolf, you need uh, in order to write, uh, you need money and a room of your own. <laughs> and for the humanities and social sciences, it's not necessarily a bigger room <laughs> that you need, you know, need the, need the colliders, but you need, you need somewhere to, to meet and think and sort of be creative uh, uh, that is uh, independent of your seniors or yeah. sort of the interest of the department or, or sort of the, the bigger structure around you, but have this, uh, this uh, little playground that you can build for yourself and these kinds of mm. small schemes is mm. what makes it possible. Mm. And Karina, I know that, I mean, you have also used the Nordic as your playground uh, mm. in your research because you have been in Umeå but you've also been in Helsinki uh, and why did you choose to to also move towards uh, move past border cross borders in the Nordics well in fact I was in Rovaniemi in, in northern Finland mm, okay. so I hope to, I hope the sound is slightly better now yes a little bit so I yeah yeah we, we, okay, we try. I will try to speak really really slowly no of course the uh, support systems for Nordic mobility are very positive and I think also, as many people have said already, the chances to build some kind of Nordic cooperation are very valuable. These are countries with a lot in common, but also important to look into what are the differences in you know, governance systems and so on. So there's lots of really important research to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course, the calls and the also announcements that have been done today are very positive. <laughs> that said, uh, I mean, just a comment on also some other things people have been mentioning so far. Um, I think the crucial part is really that calls need to be fairly open. A large issue for discussion now has been this, you know, mission and challenge versus blue sky research. And to be honest, I think the most uh, important way to actually get at challenges or mission driven research uh, is really to allow blue skies research mm. and maybe mention potential challenges that can be addressed, maybe not in, you know, the exact uh, calculable impact, as someone said. I mean, a lot of the work we do in, for instance, social science and humanities uh, is really about the large challenges. It's not just the natural science advising decision makers on what to do, but it's really how to do it. It's the implementation, it's the different actors, the institutions, the practices that need to change, for instance, to deal with climate change, and if people were to allow these kind of issues in more open calls, instead of, for instance, assuming that social science is a smaller support to natural science or not key to these issues, I think we'd actually get, we would get more at the core of social science, which is not you know, simple or uncomplex, but really shows that the complexity of dealing with each, these challenges. And that I think sim does not always go true in you know, call writing. If we, when we come to this, I mean, the supportive frameworks, um, are there any differences between uh, the countries we represent here, Sweden, Finland and Norway? And is there anything we could learn from the differences in the, when you, it comes to the frameworks? Anyone knowing what is going on across borders who, who can start? Tell you, you know, are there any differences here that we should pinpoint? 
not that I'm aware of. My general impression is that it's fairly similar. I mean, there are all tiny differences between the various research councils, but the overall support mechanisms are very similar as far mm. as I know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Then we can go move on to the next question. What role does research mobility between the Nordic countries play? We've touched upon it uh, fairly, but uh, Hilda, do you want to start? Which role does the mobility play? Um, it enhances our, uh, our world, basically. It makes, uh, it makes us... Uh, uh, it enriches both our research and, uh, and uh, what we have, well, the findings we have, this, what we, the questions we ask, uh, the numbers about the international mobility and, and the hirings in Norway. I think it's, it's a sign that we are a truly international research community, uh, which is very... It, it obviously uh, causes certain challenges when it comes to the, a, n a number of jobs available, but at the same time, I think it's one of the best things that's happened in the region, and, or perhaps Nordic academic, that it's, we, the world wants to come <laughs> to us. Uh, uh, and we, there are nice funding schemes for, uh, for research mobility, but what I miss actually is this uh, um, lightweight version of, of, uh, of mobility, that we have great grants for going abroad for, for mm. longer periods of time, but these shorter, uh, shorter uh, um, uh, visit smaller grants for, for having guest researchers, for having uh, um, associates coming uh, to stay at our own department for us go to visit. Uh, that's often what is lacking for younger researchers because we, ha because we have shorter uh, um, contracts or smaller you know, uh, um, uh, available funding for, for our, that we can spend as, as we would like ourselves, driftsmidler as it's called mm. in the region. So, so this sort of um, enabling mobility that is not as... Uh, as um, uh, ambitious, <laughs> that's, uh, that's actually something that we could, uh, could really enhance, uh, I think. Mm. Uh, because I, I think for, for research as, as in, in general, for scholarship and for our thinking, it's, the mobility is, is crucial and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, we really need, need uh, even more of it, I think. Talia. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and I think uh, the purpose of NOS HS has always been to to facilitate that kind of mobility with these exploratory workshops, also with this uh, new call, um, which is a one-time call. I don't think that we will be able to do it again, but at least for those three years. Um, the, you know, there are requirements that you have to have a workshop in each country and you have to make sure that you meet, but you're not going to be able to meet for months mm. at a time, but you can meet for a week, for example, mm. and do uh, a lot of work in that time span. Uh, so I think that's really crucial, but it's also interesting to note that in the old days, most of the Nordic uh, joint work would happen in one of the Nordic languages or in all of the Nordic languages at the same time. We're seeing less of that now. Mm. We're doing this in English, yeah. uh, as the director of the Norwegian Language Council has... Um, criticized. Uh, criticized, yes. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think we're going to see more of English, uh, mm -hmm. both because we see, and we've done research on this, that the inter understanding between the Nordic languages is becoming less, um, it's not as good as it used to be. That's what I fight every week. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you're doing yeah, a good job, I'm, so keep fighting. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. But we need to keep fighting that, uh, that fight. But there's another reason, right, which, which is that we're becoming more international. We're attracting more international faculty. Mm. And it's hard. One thing is to learn Norwegian or Danish or Swedish mm. or Icelandic or Finnish. But being able to do that in, as a second language or a third or a fourth or a fifth mm. is challenging. One thing is for us to understand a Danish-speaking person, and another thing is for an Asian person mm. or uh, someone who has a very different language as their mm. uh, native language. So, you know, I think we also need to think about this in, in the context of mobility. Mm. How can we continue fighting the fight to ensure the vitality of the Nordic languages as research languages yeah. and as academic languages. Yeah, because that was, I mean, since you are uh, at University of Trondheim, uh, there was recently this article about how, how uh, the University of Trondheim uh, has, or who is it, a council, deciding upon that English is, is a preferred language and Swedish is not. Well, the students. So we have an ongoing yeah. revision of our language policies, which yeah. I've also led. Yeah. And uh, as a part of that debate, the students said that they don't want any teaching in uh, the Nordic languages. They want it in English as opposed to Danish or Swedish. But I can reveal we're about to give uh, the rector our recommendations and we're sticking to what the law now says, which is that yeah. Swedish and Danish are equal to Norwegian. Mm. So um, the students feel very strongly about this and we've listened and we've discussed it, but I think it's important to stick to the... Mm. 
and the old principles in that sense. And I've, I thought about Daria because you've been researching into climate policies as well, uh, and uh, being close in the neighboring countries, not having to go so far. I mean, isn't that also a call for the future? I have a comment on that. Actually, I noted this, uh, that the, the issue of sustainability definitely should be discussed here. But at the same time, let's be honest, we have a very big region. Mm. Geographically speaking, <laughs> uh, getting from Helsinki to Aalborg is quite a trap. If you look at Central Europe, they basically can go everywhere by train, within a couple of hours they're there. It's not the case for us, we're still bound to flying. Mm. So I'm actually not quite sure. Uh, we, we would like to make the point that we are so close because we mentally feel close. I think geographically we are not as close and we still need to cover quite mm. a large distances <laughs> to see each other. Uh, and probably you guys here in Scandinavia have a slightly different perspective, but you know, on the other side of the Baltics in Finland, we are just so far from, <laughs> from everything. And we, of course, can take a boat to Stockholm, but that's more or less it. <laughs> then we, it becomes a bit more, more challenging. But I actually want to make a slightly different point, and I wanted to go one step mm. behind uh, two PhD students. And... Um, to say something that was for a very long time on my mind, when I was a PhD student, I actually got most of my methodological training, and I must reveal I did a lot of methodology courses, in the Nordic countries. Mm. I have been in Aarhus, in Roskilde, in Oslo, and uh, the list can be continued. Mm. I think that we actually have fabulous methodological expertise in the Nordics. And moreover, it's not the same in each country. Mm. Uh, just to make a few examples, mm. we have a brilliant school of multivariate statistics and, uh, let's say, um, correspondence analysis in, in Finland and specifically in Helsinki. We have fabulous experts on digital mm. humanities in Sweden. Uh, we have in uh, Denmark internet and IT research from the social science perspective, really strong school there. I wonder how could that be somehow connected, you know, connecting the dots, because if we join our forces, to be quite honest, we have absolutely fantastic methodological expertise in the Nordics that potentially could be available to all PhD students because one of the things is most of our courses are actually free of charge. Mm. And this is something that I realized very early on. It has not been advertised anywhere, but as a, as a PhD student from Finland, I could just get enrolled in Roskilde. The only thing I needed was to get there, but you know, you can always find somehow ways around it. And then you can get fantastic training and meet people from around the corner. I thought that was really very important to my becoming a researcher, having an ability to build upon all of this expertise. But I don't think there is any kind of a formal arrangement around it, nor kind of thinking of how to promote this methodological hub of the Nordics mm. and make it really visible and available to early career researchers, to PhD students from the region. That would be so fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think this is an excellent point and something that we should try to do something about. We have a scheme in Norway which is called graduate schools uh, and you can, have, uh, can apply to the research council for that. Uh, but we see a tendency that many of the areas in the humanities and maybe parts of the social sciences are just too small. We don't have enough PhD mm -hmm. candidates to justify uh, such graduate schools, uh, or you have to make them so general that it becomes a bit hard mm. to, uh, to cater to everyone. But maybe we should exploit the Nordic context more in this regard. Mm. So this is an idea that I would like to take back to the mm. committee so we can talk about and see if we can find ways of, in the future, supporting Nordic uh, graduate schools in the humanities and social sciences, especially for the smaller areas, mm. say the foreign languages or uh, you know, many other areas that are not uh, populated by a huge number of students mm. and where we don't want a huge number of students because they're not jobs for a huge number of students, but we need to educate some. Mm. So I think this is a great point that we should follow up on. But uh, how, how, do you, how do you see it in practicality? How, how, can, you, how can something like that be built? 
So I think that's quite, uh, that's quite easy. We can follow the models that already exist. Mm -hmm. And I, for eight years, was involved in the Norwegian Graduate School in Linguistics that we had mm -hmm. uh, from 2013 to 2021. And we had some Nordic guests occasionally. And it's quite easy. You mm -hmm. travel around. You have to travel. That's the, that's the only thing. But you can then imagine using the strengths of the various places and put together a course portfolio yeah. uh, that complement each other. And I think, you know, with small resources, this doesn't require a lot of administration. Uh, it requires academic people who are interested in creating the courses, and you can invite other people to contribute mm. as well. Mm. So I think running it is quite easy, but we need some funding. Um, so I guess that will be the main job to see <laughs> if we can convince yeah. the research councils in the Nordic countries mm. to find some funding for something like that. I think that will be uh, mm. really exciting if we mm. can do that. Karina, what's your bet on yes, this just question? Just to add to the ongoing discussion then, um, I mean, not just because I'm on link, <laughs> but because, you know, the world has changed a bit in the last few years. I also think it's a great opportunity to really do, you know, more common maybe Nordic research schools. And also some could travel, but also maybe a very large group could be present, you know, through Zoom or whatever it might be. You know, really opening possibilities for people who might not have either the funding to travel or the possibilities are really to still meet Nordic peers. And on that note, I think also that, you know, not just methodology, but theory in different areas could be of really great interest. Mm. Uh, so there's large possibilities there, I think. Mm. And then I also just want to comment one thing about this Nordic um, cooperation issue and also the uh, workshops, which I think maybe also speaks to the last question about uh, yeah, are the difference, differences between the countries. And I think they really are. We applied for workshops with participants from Norway, Sweden and Finland. And in Norway they said, yeah, it's no problem. If we get funding for the workshop, then we can travel and write this paper. In Sweden we said, yeah, maybe if we can get it into the funding we have. And in Finland they said, well, we need to get the work done by the PhD students and postdocs who are funded to do it. So I think really the funding situation is something one really has to look into also in Nordic research, who is actually even able to participate in workshops, is there a need for some basic funding there, you know, and really to also understand the very differing and also changing circumstances in the different countries. What are really the possibilities for people to cooperate? So just to also add, add that as a comment. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, and, and Norfolk, I mean, it's supposedly, uh, supposedly we should live in the world's mo most and best integrated region, as it's, uh, it was stated some years back by the prime ministers in the Nordics. Uh, but still, we hear here that, that there are some differences making it, uh, there is a challenge there. And Norfolk, what kind of obstacles do you see in Norfolk? Uh, the, the, what is called grensehindring, the obstacles of borders, I don't know how to translate it, but, but what, what are the, the biggest challenges here? Well, I think the biggest challenge is to get everyone on board with the same policies because different countries have different priorities and different countries have different amounts of money and funding and they have different flexibility in terms of how the funding can mm. be allocated. But I'm not so worried about that. I think we just have to keep talking about these things. Mm. And the good thing about this committee, for example, is that we also contribute to information sharing across the research council. So there is a part of the program which is uh, also for the administrators so that they know what's going on in the different councils. What are the mm. issues? What are the problems? And mm. my impression after the years that I've been there is that they're very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, they struggle with too many applications, too many people spend time on applications that don't get funded. Mm -hmm. How can we try to find good ways of reducing that? Um, we haven't been able to come up with a good solution yet, mm -hmm. but you know, it's important to keep talking about these things and also share other experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think keeping the conversation going is, uh, is crucial, mm -hmm. but then with certain uh, you need to have certain goals as well, and, and I think uh, the goal of trying to create a Nordic graduate school will be a good uh, goal for the future. Mm.
And I mean, we talked about whether it's sustainable or not to be in this Nordic uh, context. The other thing is also an issue of trust. I mean, we live in the Nordics uh, supposedly on top of the world when it comes to trust, the level of trust. Uh, but now we are also in a situation where we are really pushed upon on our borders. Sweden and Finland will choose, uh, I mean, the application for NATO is already, uh, are they already there. Um, and I looked into this because uh, on the 7th, 7th of June we celebrated, or at least uh, we heard salutes in the city, uh, we celebrated that we were no longer part of Sweden in 1905. Uh, and I read a little bit into what happened actually in the, the, those years. And it it's said that, I mean, yeah, we were not longer in this union, but actually, the years after 1905, you could see that the cult on the cultural sector, humanities came, became closer and closer in the Nordics. And that was, of course, what was first foremost in, in the Scandinavian countries, but also in the Nordics. And now what is happening now is like, I mean, if something would happen on the border of Finland, who will you go to for help before Finland joins NATO? It's, it's us. And in order to get us fighting, we need trust. And I think I've been thinking about that because we now sit talking about humanities and social sciences, and this dives directly into some of the issues that we experience today. And isn't that also one of, uh, of uh, the examples on uh, why uh, blue sky research is important? and open, open and, uh, uh, I mean, research is important. Hilde? I think every time we have this uh, new world situation, new crisis, pandemic, uh, things like this show up, suddenly humanities and social sciences research, research that has long been sort of just blue sky, just curiosity driven, becomes extremely relevant and sort of acute mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, knowledge needs uh, arise. And I think, that, as you said, suddenly this uh, geopolitical shift that we are seeing, it makes it, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a living proof that the humanities and social sciences is, uh, is vital for just understanding what is going on, for informing our policies uh, and for sort of yeah, guiding, guiding our path forward. So, so uh, in, in a sense, I think that this, uh, this separation between blue sky research and, uh, and mission or challenge driven research is, is a bit uh, unnecessary, I think, in the, in the social sciences and humanities, especially because it, understanding the world uh, and, and the humans in it is uh, mm. that it, little can be more relevant in, and suddenly become sort of acutely uh, critical to, to um, yeah, mm. bring out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think it, we used to have these discussions, in, and especially in Norway, but I think in the other Nordic countries as well, you know, why do we need the humanities? We consistently had to justify our existence. Mm -hmm. And I think that has changed a little bit in recent years. We had a, a government report on the humanities, which really, I think, helped booster our identity and, and our self-confidence in some ways. But there's also been other initiatives which uh, goes into what Hilde is talking about, namely uh, to integrate the humanities and social sciences better into thematic-oriented mm. programs. So someone mentioned climate research. You can think of many other things, the ocean, uh, since we're in Bergen. Uh, you know, the Im importance of doing um, social sciences and humanities research into typical natural sciences mm. uh, areas is also really vital. And I see a change among some of our PhDs, at least, mm. that they're really eager to contribute um, knowledge that has a more immediate impact. Mm. Uh, they want to see that it matters for the society, not just for the academic community, mm. and it has to happen faster. Mm. So I think they don't really see this opposition, um, and I think that also helps the humanities and social sciences be more relevant, mm. because we engage directly uh, into things that matter to society. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't also do things that have no immediate mm. impact at all, but I think there is a change, and I think we can exploit that mm. to the advantage of our fields. Daria, I, I am very curious to hear, because you also, you've been partly in, in Russia as well. And I was, when I read into your biography, I thought, hmm, did something happen to your research uh, post 24th of February? I mean, where you're suddenly something else where go, went on in the world? Um, and did you recognize any uh, interest in your research post that day 
Have you gotten more questions, for instance? Right. Uh, yes. So to clarify, I actually work at the Institute for Russian, East European <laughs> and Eurasian Studies, uh, which means that uh, post 24th of February, we were pretty much in the spotlight mm. and the center of interest. Uh, at the same time, we had to call a few emergency meetings because uh, one of the big questions has been how do we actually do research from now mm. on? Uh, obviously, many of us, most of us, uh, our research uh, work and a lot of our empirical work has been based on fieldwork in Russia and uh, mm. on uh, communication with colleagues from Russia which uh, in one day has just become not feasible anymore. Um, it is a very uh, tricky situation. I myself was in the middle of running a large um, survey experiment that we had to just stop mm. for an, an unknowable amount of time, right? Uh, but that, that's, that's just, you know, a, a minor inconvenience in comparison to the broader... Um, thing that is right now going on. On the one hand, it seems like our expertise is needed. Mm. On the other hand, researchers also raise a lot of questions with regard to whether our line of research will receive funding and how can we actually make our work solid, empirically based, if we don't have access mm. to research materials that we would need. Mm. Uh, we don't want to roll back into the so-called Sovietology, you know, the Cold War style area studies, but it seems that the mm. way how we have been doing work in the past 20 years, it, at least at the moment, is not possible. Our field is in, in, in quite a tricky situation right now, mm. I would say. But I also wanted to make a comment with regard to, to the opposition mm between the uh, blue sky and, and the mission-driven research. And I think what we have heard uh, throughout this whole Berkwick from Sheila Jasanov several times is that the thing what social sciences and humanities are doing is not only with what is, mm. but with what ought to mm. be, right? There is always, if, if it's implicit or explicit, a normative underpinning mm. to what we are doing. And uh, if there is a normative underpinning, it is a mission-driven research. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of funny in, in, in a very different way, mission-driven. <coughs> if you have this normative goal of seeing the world that is somehow better improved or collectively imagining what should the world be and how can we integrate more voices. Even if it's not mission oriented in a sense of this is the acute challenge we are now solving, this blue sky research is nonetheless mission driven. It's driven by this willingness to contribute to the greater good. And therefore, I also do not see this opposition, but in a, in a different way. Mm. And Karina, what, what's your perspective on uh, the blue sky research division? Yeah, like many other speakers, I also don't really, really think this exists as a division. I think what is really crucial is to understand the enormous breadth of social science and the humanities. We heard earlier about you know, programs on the ocean or climate change that would include you know, also social science and humanities, which are of course very important. But I think it's also important to understand that you know, social science that is issue focused is never only issue focused. I mean, if someone looks at decision processes in the ocean or on forests or on whatever it might be, it might still be decision processes or implementation or, you know, these type of issues. And these will be crucial to know about in almost any research program. And this, this enormous amounts of cumulative knowledge in the social sciences, often in different theoretical orientations, but it's really enormously important to understand any type of change, whether this is trying to induce change or understand change or understanding what is hindering change. So there's lots and lots of these type issues, even in the things that might seem the most uh, 
the most blue skies, you know, because we have this war now. And if one looks at, I mean, literature, literature criticism, when they talk about the construction of monsters in literature, I mean, and then you see the war when people discuss, or the Ukrainians discuss Russians and orcs as orcs, you know, as in, <laughs> in fantasy. And of course, the Russians try to construct Ukrainians as Nazis. You know, this is really the creation of monsters. And there's lots of information, even in the most, what might seem the most obscure blue sky research about how this is done and what mechanisms are employed to do these type of things, which may also be relevant for the study of war. Mm. So, you know, there's this enormous amount of information, mm. really broadly, in social science and humanities, which, mm. and this, I think, really has to be made apparent in making less narrow calls and knowing about the different theories and the different threats that exist in social science that issue driven research is never only about any one issue. Thank you. And I mean, in order to try, we have five minutes of kind of summing up uh, before the break and before the next panel. Uh, and uh, what I hear here is that, okay, it's not, it's not always about the funding. Uh, it's about collaboration. Uh, it's about uh, not too many narrowed down uh, applications or uh, programs. Uh, and uh, I also hear that the Nordics can actually be a, be, a, be a bigger mirror to see each other in. Or what, what, what's your way of summing this up, Hilda? Uh, for the next panel, you said that very often it's like first the rector is sitting, and then the young re younger researchers will listen. But what's your advice? I think the uh, summing up the word you just said, collaboration, mm. uh, that there, there are so many structures or structural uh, paths or pressures in the sector that m forces us to be very individualistic. Mm. Uh, your individual career, uh, your, uh, the hiring processes, the grants, mm. uh, it forces you to think of your own career. Uh, and uh, instead of thinking of research as, as scholarship, as, as uh, you know, collaborations and, and collectives for thinking and, and, uh, and working together. So that we, instead of thinking about just the job, we should be thinking about the work in a sense and the, and the content of what we do. And, and I think it's that the, all the, uh, those who are in sort of the leadership positions should really take care to think of how can we build uh, rooms, spaces, uh, uh, collaborations for young researchers that, that f gives them the security or the sort of the, um, uh, the confidence to to uh, to uh, to work uh, sort of with a long-term perspective mm. and to collaborate with the peers or their own um, mm. own uh, career levels uh, and to be to be bold and and um, and build their sort of independence. Mm. Um, so not uh, yeah to to foster a sort of an um, encouraging community that uh, that uh, allows just for both for ambition and and mm. uh, creativity. Mm. Mm. Tell you. Yeah, to follow up on that, I think what the minister um, said when he highlighted career guidance is really important. And I think what uh, the University of Bergen is doing is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And I hope that it can be a role model for the rest of us. Mm. Uh, because we haven't been very good in Norway when it comes to career planning. Mm. Uh, many professors just say, well, I don't know how to do this because I, you know, I've been at the university my whole life. But I think that's an that's too easy to say that. I think there are many things you can do, many questions you can ask PhD candidates and postdocs uh, that will help them think about what their career goals should be. Um, and, but I think we also need the kind of center that has been uh, established here uh, to professionalize uh, this work. But I think that's really vital to help them because I noticed that there are many things that we take for granted uh, those of us who have been around for a little bit at least, that students don't see. They need to be explained and you, they need to see these things and think about them. And so I really think we need to professionalize mm -hmm. uh, career guidance and we need to take it seriously, uh, which there has been no culture for uh, in the past. But should, could this be a model for all the Nordics so the Nordics will oh. have one the similar pattern in career guiding? Sure, I think that would be a very exciting mm. uh, thing to do mm. um, because I think the issues are the same across mm. these countries to a large extent. There are some differences, but to a large extent, they're the same. I go to you, Corina, first, so you are not always <laughs> on the, the end line here. Uh, what's your kind of, what's your conclusion, your concluding remark? Yeah, I think I will again just agree with what people have said just previously. 
I think the most important issue really for any type of collaboration funding or you know working more closely across the Nordics is really to enable people to work on content. I mean careers notwithstanding of course one has to get have a job to work on the content but really any type of research which, which does not box us in but enables this very broad interdisciplinary work to really show up on the cumulative nature and also the variation across different theories and disciplines that exist in the social science and humanities and how we then can make use of this for what might be called mission or challenge driven research. That's really the, I think the crucial thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank right. you. Mm, I would probably sum it up. I really liked your comment about collaboration and about how um, we have to very often think, put ourselves first and, you know, really look for yourself before you, you engage with others. But I would also say that uh, whereas on an individual level that's maybe not an, a feature that necessarily in the long term is the best strategy, I would also say that maybe as a, as a Nordic research community, we are also measuring ourselves up very much with uh, other research communities, let's say the, in, in, in the, um, on the British Isles or across the Atlantic. And I think, uh, well, uh, just a little anecdote, right? Uh, Escola, who is doing a research on some US-based topic in the US, does not need to justify why they cho choose US as a case study, mm -hmm. but as a Finnish scholar, uh, applying for funding in Finland, so for Finnish tax uh, uh, euros, I have to explain why Finland is a good case to study this. Mm. Right? So it, there is some kind of a weird thing going on here mm. that we maybe should allow ourselves to be a little more self-centered yeah. and to say that it is uh, not only okay, it is appropriate and it is um, prudent mm. Mm. to pay attention to ourselves, mm. to study ourselves, mm. to uh, collaborate mm. with each other and maybe not measure ourselves up mm. to, to others necessarily, but by the uh, inherent quality of what we are doing. Mm. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful final remark here. Uh, and thanks all of you for joining in. Uh, now we will have a break until five past 11, 11 or 5, and then we will be back for the next panel. So please enjoy the break and keep on talking <laughs> about this.
Welcome back after the break. Uh, did you c keep on talking about this issue now? Can I see hands up in the air? Oh, that's wonderful. Means that something has already started. So we will continue now uh, uh, after this break. And I'm so proud that I can now in invite up on stage uh, this year's Slims Cl <laughs> Nils Klims Laureate. Please welcome again, Lisa Kismaki. I know that you're quite tired now. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long week, a lot of um, celebrations, <laughs> activities. It's been a wonderful week, but yeah, but yeah the energy yeah, levels are not the highest yeah. possible yes. anymore at the moment. <laughs> I will also invite your fellow panelists here up, Jesper Simonsen from the Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian Research Council. You're still here, still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. And also back, Margot Hagen, you can come up here again and join in on this uh, panel. You can leave your center party <laughs> jacket <laughs> down there. <laughs> uh, and we can all sit down, I think, and wait for Margaret to come up here. Uh, and you've been sitting in all day. And before we jump into to this, to, to the to the theme. The topic of this panel, I just want to ask you, Elisa, uh, what were your responses to what you've already heard? I've heard a lot of um, yeah, interesting, relevant things that I can relate to. Uh, maybe I'll just start with, uh, yeah, by, by returning to, to Daria's uh, final note. So, so she was talking about how we should be yeah, proud of what we do here in the Nordic countries and what we have, and not to, to underestimate ourselves. Mm. And, and, and that also yeah, made me think of how, how um, yeah, there are so many yeah, missed opportunities when it comes to, to collaboration and opportunities that we have here in Nordic countries. And here I'm also critical of myself. So, so if I think of, uh, I mean, before I moved to, to Denmark, I got a permanent position there. I had never been to another Nordic country apart, like living in another Nordic country, apart from one summer that I spent in Iceland when I was 20 years old. Yeah. But I had lived in uh, lots of different countries uh, yeah. elsewhere in the world. And this is also something that, you know, now, yeah, mobility is very important in academia and, and our carriers are mobile and, and we move across the world, but, but somehow, like, yeah, do, do we really um, see Nordic collaboration and Nordic stays mm. as, a, as an asset uh, that, that brings us opportunities? So, so that's something mm. I, yeah, I took from the, from, from the panel and, and, yeah, what, what I would also like to, um, yeah, I would certainly like to promote the idea of it as an asset in the, in the yeah, future. Yeah, uh, the first time we talked, uh, you actually also said that you, you, uh, you are not aware of the career path even, and we're, not, we're now entering this uh, panel with some of these questions, and, and I will, and I, of course, later on, I will also hear what you took from the, the former panel, Margaret and Jesper. But first, uh, Elisa, I want to ask you, what responsibility do universities and funders have to support research in the humanities and social sciences? And of course, as a laureate, I guess you have a long list of answers to that question. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think, yeah, many arguments uh, could be made, but yes, of course, as someone who, who studies the, the human past, I would also like to just begin with the, with the historical note that if we think of the beginning of the European University institution with four faculties, uh, theology, philosophy, law, and medicine, so, so three quarters of the curriculum consisted of, of social, uh, social sciences, humanities, um, uh, yeah, what would be understood as those fields today. So, so to me, it would be, yeah, uh, it would seem to, to indicate a very high level of, of hubris to, to think that we somehow could manage uh, without these um, types of expertise or, or that they would not be relevant to our societies mm. today as well. But also I think that Social sciences and humanities, they do produce expertise in, in human culture and experience in all its diversity, both past and, and present. Also the, the beauty, but also the tragedy of what mm. it is to be human. Uh, where do we come from? How to, how to live together? So, so these are questions that are, are really uh, valid and relevant to, to any period of time. I also think that these fields um, 
share an idea that we have to go beyond superficial knowledge. Mm -hmm. So our understanding of phenomena, human phenomena, but also societal phenomena, it has to be informed uh, both historically and, and conceptually. So, so we have to understand the ideologies that shape our decision-making consciously and unconsciously. We have to, to consider the bigger picture and history is important in that um, my professor in Helsinki, Martin Nissinen, sometimes said that that uh, yeah, those who, who don't uh, study history behave like yeah, people with dementia unpredictably. So, so we, we need um, yeah, a, a, an understanding of, of yeah, where we come from and, and what has happened in the past and what can we learn from, learn from the past. Um, in addition, I think in these fields, we, are, we, we bring an important message to the society in that we remind the society about the, the deeper purpose of education, mm. that it's something, I, I don't know, I would characterize it as, as formative. So, so education, it's not just about technical skills or, or knowledge that one needs to perform a particular task, but it's, it's about personal and cultural maturation. Um, and also it's, it's a yeah, lifelong process mm. of development. And, and this is of course something that, that uh, people have um, thought about since antiquity. So, mm. so the ancient authors talk about paideia and humanitas, mm. and, and then later on we have the German concept of Bildung. So, so I, I think all that continues to be very relevant um, today. So overall, you just get so much uh, for reasonably yeah, small amount of money yeah. uh, when you think about education in these fields. I, I find it very interesting, though, that whenever I talk with someone from the humanities or social sciences, especially humanities, uh, it's very easy for me to understand why history these days is mm -hmm. crucial. But still, it is as if it's hard to get that argument through. And why do you think it is like that? I don't know. People are just maybe... I don't know. It's just so... so um, of course, yeah, our own lived realities... Lived realities um, uh, they just, yeah, we're just so, so yeah, I I deep in them and, and concerned by the, their issues. And also maybe there is this in our society, yeah, thinking of future and, and preparing for, for future chances. But, but then somehow, how, uh, yeah, not having the, the yeah, not, want, not wanting to slow down. And mm. because when you think about history, when you learn history, you have to, 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 to slow down. So maybe it doesn't somehow. Mm. Uh, we don't want to go back to in order to go forward. Yeah, or maybe. Just, yeah, you have to slow the tempo and, and uh, mm. think, so, so maybe that's something that our time doesn't, mm. doesn't appreciate, but I don't know. Mm. From uh, the Research Council's perspective, uh, how would you put on an argument for the humanities and social sciences? Um, we treat, of course, the humanities and social sciences like all other sciences when it comes to basic research, but the problem is that uh, uh, especially humanities and some of the social sciences has not grasped the possibilities, the, the opportunities which lays in the targeted research. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the discussion about blue sky versus uh, uh, more applied science or innovation is some, uh, somewhat uh, not uh, nuanced enough because it com it's, uh, it's financed by different uh, uh, public purses and even also from private purses, if you do it the right way. Mm. So um, I, I think uh, uh, about the um, parallel to medical research, where you have the basic research, you have the clinical research, but you have also the translation research, which tries to, uh, to verify what, what is really the, the great uh, uh, and useful findings in the basic research. Mm -hmm. But I think we should have more blue sky research and more uh, bottom-up uh, research, but it's not in conflict with grasping the possibilities which lays in the new, more targeted uh, 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 schemes. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to the discussion about missions, missions was introduced as one of two uh, important efforts from the uh, Commission of the European Union mm -hmm. 
to uh, um, re-establish the social contract between the society and research. It should show uh, that the research was very useful for the, the public and for uh, everyday life. Uh, and um, mission was one thing. You should solve real-life problems. <laughs> and the other thing was open science. So people should understand what, why science was good and could participate in science. And in missions, uh, you, have, uh, you, ha you need to have good uh, blue sky research as well, and, and more targeted uh, basic research, and all, all the, what in innovation language is called TRL uh, niveau, uh, levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, when, when I listened to Daria, uh, if I understood you correctly, Daria, you also said that uh, this uh, targeted or mission-driven research should also be added into, I mean, because the humanities very often search for a better life, uh, better way of living, better world, that is a mission in itself, and that it's the, the division is kind of, uh, doesn't pick up on that. Uh, that. That is also into very many of the research uh, uh, yeah, projects that are there. Yeah, yeah I, I accept that, and of course everybody have their own uh, opinion of what's the big problems in the world. Mm. And uh, there should be a lot of money f for uh, good researchers to uh, pursue research on what they think is the important thing. But society also have an opinion of what is the real uh, uh, things, which need more funding. Mm. And I think uh, you wouldn't have the uh, climate uh, re research which we have today if we didn't prioritize that from the public uh, purse. Uh, and, uh, but that is not instead of the money for the blue sky research. It's, it comes from other sources. Mm. It comes from people uh, working on, on the climate uh, uh, challenge, not from uh, the, uh, the research uh, uh, ministry or something like that. So in Norway we have this funding where something is for basic research, and then the other uh, ministries should uh, add up with money which is important for them. And uh, in, man, in many fields, even the, um, even the private sector also finance really basic research. <coughs> and it's interesting to see in the pand uh, pandemic, we were very well prepared for uh, one part of the pandemic, mm -hmm. where the, it has been a, a huge... Uh, Blue, even blue sky, but also targeted basic research, and that was on vaccine development. Mm. But we were totally unprepared mm. in many other fields, mm. both in the med uh, in the health fields, mm. but also in uh, tackling this in the social areas, uh, where we didn't have this foundation of, of uh, 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 basic research. Mm. Margaret, I mean, perhaps it, we could even say that, okay, if, uh, if the society would have listened more to, to people coming from humanities, we wouldn't have had the climate crisis in the first place, but the, perhaps even, even the mm. pandemics. But uh, that's probably a little bit too, too mm. superficial or whatever to, to say. But uh, what's your, I mean, what do you, what's your answer to the question, what responsibility do universities and funders have to support research in humanities and social sciences? It's a huge question, of course, and I, I completely agree on what is said here to a certain extent. But what, what we should also be aware of is that uh, we talk about SSH, but the difference between SS and H mm. are there. I mean, it's a huge... Uh, I think in Norway, uh, the, uh, the Norwegian Research Council gives somewhat like uh, like five percent to three. to the humanities. Only three. Three percent to humanities and more than twenty to 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 social mm -hmm. sciences and so uh, of course there is a, there is a difference there and you could say that okay it doesn't cost that much you you, will, you are able to do your research uh, uh, in your positions in uh, in the departments and it's funded by our education programs if we have this research intensive university as we have but it's still it's still a challenge that only three or four or maybe mm. it has increased a little bit is given to 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 humanities when you 
think about how big n n the number of uh, scholars in humanities uh, is in Norway, and which makes it also the humanities is also the field of study where the competition is toughest. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, first of all, if you embark a career, uh, uh, if you um, uh, as a researcher within the humanities, first of, uh, and foremost, you have to to compete. Mm. internationally, mm. To, get, to have a PhD uh, scholarship, to have a postdoc scholarship, not to talk about yes, a permanent mm. position. And then uh, you also uh, need, and we all, that's a responsibility, our responsibility, uh, our common responsibility also to, to make uh, uh, the public sector, the private sector aware of the competences mm. in, uh, uh, among those scholars. That, because there is no possibility that they could have a, a permanent position mm. at our universities, uh, all of them, because they have also decreased the numbers of scholars also in the humanities has decreased uh, a lot um, these, uh, these last 20 years. So I think as, that we also, as institutions, we should be much more... Yeah, we have uh, established this career centre, mm. the UIB, but we should also be much more aware of the ecosystem and, and take, take care uh, of uh, how, we, um, yeah, uh, how we recruit, uh, take care of our recruitments, mm. In the long, uh, to secure also stable and long-lasting uh, research uh, groups and fields at the university, because that is our um, primary ta task. Mm. And we have seen it now. It's, it's easy to understand when you have this, yeah, the war going on in Ukraine. Maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, there are less interest to study mm. Russian or Ukrainian, who cares? Mm. Who cares? Okay, the student doesn't come, maybe we should have a, yeah, what, yeah maybe that's not a big, big issue, but then the prepa preparedness mm. and, uh, yeah, uh, that lies within the university, that when, when a crisis occurs, we don't know when it mm. will occur, but we are there, we are able to, yeah, we have expertise in, in Russian and Ukrainian history in, in, in the languages. And that's hugely, hugely important. And when it comes to career um, guidance, and uh, I think first and foremost, we should be much more prof professional mm -hmm. as institutions. Mm -hmm. We should uh, also try to yeah, be clear about what are the different mm. tasks we have? Yeah, uh, the supervisors is not. They are not necessarily uh, the. Um, um, they don't have. Yeah, I'm just trying to put my words right, so I'm <laughs> going to offend anyone. But they don't have the competence to ha to to guide. Uh, scho uh, the scholars and to also maybe to see the opportunities outside the mm. university. So that's why we, we need a, a career uh, center that we have uh, established and we should also uh, be clear about the, the responsibilities that lies within the different uh, departments and also mm. of course the, the head of the research groups and to, to, yeah, mm. to have good onboarding and outboarding programs etc. Mm. Uh, et because I think, and this is something that is, uh, and now I'm talking as rector, not, not as um, a, a scholar in the humanities, I think it's something that we should be more aware of that the scholars in the humanities, they are recruited in a way that is hugely competitional, much, mm. much, much more than in, in, in other fields, mm. because there is such a demand on... Mm. Uh, yeah. So that's also interesting. So, so that if, if that could help also to elevate their status as, mm. as, as scholars among us, that is uh, mm. something to maybe to, to talk more about. Yeah.
And uh, how do you think then that we can sh secure the perspectives from the humanities and social sciences to a greater extent to become integral, uh, integral parts of challenges and mission-driven research as we talked about now? How is it possible to, to push through? I think there are good processes going mm. on in the Norwegian Research Council when it comes to that. And, and uh, I also think that uh, uh, among uh, the, the scholars of the humanities, they should also uh, be more... Um, uh, see the possibilities that lies within the European framework program mm. because there are possibilities there uh, indeed also when it comes to cultural heritage mm. and I would really also uh, I, I would have found it very interesting if we could have a challenge that like m was more uh, into cultural heritage or mm. uh, more maybe um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a challenge that is more inherited or more close, uh, con closely connected to the humanities mm. and social sciences, in a way that we should not uh, that the humanities is or in the social sciences is not just an add-on, mm. but is in the very core of the challenge. Mm. And uh, but I think that this has changed a lot to the better at least in our minds as scholars, um, the way of thinking in, uh, interdisciplinarity and also from the humanities and social sciences. I see also at the University of Bergen, we collaborate more between our faculties, the, uh, the SSH, mm. uh, no, SS, um, SSF, the Centers for Res uh, Excellent Research in the, among the applications there. Um, uh, they, there are very, very uh, many of them that have that, that uh, include scholars both from the sciences mm. and the humanities and the social sciences. So this is this is uh, changing to to the better, and I think that yeah. it is great. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's very important to write uh, perspectives from humanities and social sciences into the challenges. Uh, some years ago, we where it was very natural science-based uh, climate change research in Norway, and then we encouraged social scientists to uh, apply. Mm. And of course they didn't apply because it was writ the, the calls, the program documents were written by uh, in engineers and, mm. uh, and natural scientists. Mm. So in fact we, we tried to, we had some uh, rounds where uh, social scientists wrote their own perspectives mm. into the calls. Mm -hmm. And then it started to grow. And uh, especially, of course, for uh, political scientists and economists, which, well, I, I would say they are rather well included in uh, the challenge-driven research, but uh, not uh, law studies, because uh, mm -hmm. they are, have not done that. And I think it's both uh, our responsibility yeah. to invite uh, that kind of processes, but also, and the work must in fact be done in the, uh, in the, in the universities and the research uh, environments where they have the best knowledge about these perspectives. Mm -hmm. And that is, it should be as, well, uh, as easy to make publications mm -hmm. from participating from the humanity side as from the technological side. So we have had a lot of, uh, uh, I would almost call it false interdisciplinarity, where the technological uh, or the uh, natural science uh, part is the core, mm -hmm. and the other thing is, uh, like, call it help disciplines. I will also also ask uh, Elisa that question, but first... Uh, I would just like to mention um, this, uh, this, um, this strategic plan, uh, which, is some, which is a plan that I, I found ha hasn't got enough attention, <laughs> the attention that it you deserves. Again? This <laughs> is something very, uh, very positive from uh, our Ministry of uh, Higher Education and, and Research that last, uh, I think it was last year, that mm. they, pu they published this plan for the strategy of career re um, uh, uh, research uh, recruitment and career development among mm. researchers. Mm. So I will strongly recommend yes. to, to read it. That's why I brought it, to show it in here. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say that um, I think we haven't 
so far. Uh, until a couple of years ago, or maybe last year, uh, uh, the University of Oslo had this uh, uh, strategic uh, priority area that was the Nordic, the Nordic model or the, the mm. Nordic countries, which I find um, very interesting. I know they have a different strategic area, but I don't think uh, I think that this is yeah to to take care of also. This is an interesting part mm. of the world. I mean, mm. we are, we are not and we are not to, altogether. We are not. A, a tiny part mm. of the world, and mm. we are also there are is interesting issues for mm. maybe other parts of the world mm. to, to dig into. So, internationally speaking, to, to build a, a stronger uh, Nordic uh, collaboration is a good thing. Mm. And then uh, coming back to this this strategic uh, uh, plan or a report uh, on uh, on uh, career development and and uh, in in research. Uh, we have to be aware of uh, that um, the uh, research careers, uh, if we don't, if they are not attractive, mm. we will not be able to attract uh, Nordic scholars mm. to our universities. Mm. Uh, it, because if the career paths, if it is so much uncertainty and if it's not, yeah, mm. it, it's, it's um, because... I mean, it's a, this is an interesting part of the world, but it's not a big when it comes to number of part of the world. The, the abroad the, is, is much bigger. So uh, to recruit uh, good uh, Nordic scholars mm. also among us mm. is something that we yeah. should work the, on. The numbers you, you just gave uh, showed another picture. Mm. Uh, and of course, I want to ask the same question to you, Elisa how can we secure that the perspectives from humanities and social sciences more get into to mm -hmm. the, the, to the mission-driven research? Yeah, it's not an easy question for someone studying antiquity. In fact, I was mm -hmm. last week attending a conference in Buda in northern Norway, and then when we were waiting for the airplane at the airport, I, I posed a question to a couple of my colleagues. And they were just staring at me and, 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 and mm. no, no idea. And I think it's, it's telling, it's alarming, but maybe as well. But, but we haven't really thought about this question in the way that we probably should have. Mm. Because if this is how, how, how the, the trend is, we should be proactive rather than reactive. But then at the same time, I think many of us would also be very critical of the idea of university as an institution that is aimed at producing knowledge that is aimed at just only mm. at, at uh, concrete that the solutions. Well. So, so yeah, something we want to increase our knowledge of the world broadly understood. But of course, there are ways to to increase um, the the importance of these fields in this type of research. And I, I would go back to the basics that were also addressed in the previous panel. So. So yeah, we really have to avoid running universities like businesses. Mm. We have to secure permanent positions. Ultimately, that's the only way how scholars have freedom to think. And that's also the way how they dare to take risks and experiment mm. when they have the uh, secure permanent position to, to enable this kind of intellectual curiosity. We also have to enable basic research because we can't always predict predict what issues suddenly become issues and, mm. and when, like with pandemic or war now. So, so no one had idea that we need this type of expertise. I think we just have to study the world in all its richness and variety mm. because we can't predict the moments when, when some kind of knowledge becomes important. As someone who has worked at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, and also I'm now an associate fellow at the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies, I would say that it's very important to, to find institutes of advanced studies mm. and other areas of dialogue, because in these types of uh, scholarly communities, people come together from very different types of fields, and they form networks, and they uh, play with ideas, and, and yeah, a lot of good things can, can mm. come out of um, that, that type of uh, collaboration. I would also say that one way to secure that is to, to allocate money to projects that are truly cross-disciplinary in nature. And with that I mean that they, are, they consist of research teams <clears throat> that must have very diverse expertise, mm. also from SSH, and that they pose research questions that cannot be answered without mm. SSH. And of course the question is what kind of <clears throat> research questions are those, and I, I would think that they are questions that somehow emphasize the, the perspective of humans and communities who are experiencing, managing and interpreting 
the, the current challenges mm -hmm. that we face, whether the question is about uh, climate change or, or health or, or mental mm -hmm. health or, or something mm -hmm. else. But you have, I mean, you, in your own research, you've been moving back and forth from back in the days until up mm. till to now, now, and you also write very, about very contemporary issues. Uh, has that changed during times that you can use your knowledge on ancient times uh, up till now? Is there something in the time now where, where we are more open towards uh, your knowledge? Well, I think it also there are various traditions in my discipline and, and I come from a very historical, critical uh, background and I want to, to keep that, but then I'm also, of course, our disciplines are not fixed and they are developing and evolving and, and, and um, uh, yeah, we are always in, in, in some, way, some ways um, carrying our research in conversation with things that we see around us and, and wanting to bring the ancient text into conversation with, with, uh, with uh, what, what happens uh, today uh, in order to, to also maybe illuminate the ways in which we build on, on um, this tradition. So maybe it's also about the yeah, changes in my discipline. That, that, that there, are, there is more methodological, theor theoretical um, variety in my discipline, and, and it's, you're taken now seriously as a scholar mm. if, you, if you ask uh, different types of questions, and, and maybe that has not always been mm. the, the case. So. Mm. Uh, Margaret, you heard Daria in the first panel, and I also talked about it, how, how we could develop uh, strong centers in the Nordics for doctoral uh, uh, preparations and, uh, and, and research schools. Do you think that is a good idea to, play, to, to more uh, be aware of the strengths in each and every country? Um. First, I would like also to, to emphasize that I think that in the Nordic countries, not only in the Nordic countries, but surely in the Nordic countries, we have a quite strong tradition of the SSH, mm. uh, humanities and social sciences, which shows also uh, in the uh, ERC, um, ERC, how do you say it? <laughs> yeah, uh, numbers, yeah. Uh, both in Norway and, and uh, in the other uh, yeah, Scandinavian uh, countries. So the, there is excellent, really excellent research going on uh, in the Nordic countries. I think this is also, uh, when it comes to, um, uh, I used to be the dean of, of the Faculty of Humanities, and way back then uh, we had the discussion, discussion going on, maybe uh, within, for example, in the fields of classical studies, mm. uh, like Greek and Latin, there were so few PhD scholars in Norway that that would be a field, okay, why don't we collaborate among, among the Nordic uh, countries to have a common uh, uh, PhD uh, school? Um, so, so yes, in, in some cases, yes, but we should also remember that, yeah, um, why, yes, no, no, I th yes, uh, uh, but we should also ask why, mm. why uh, uh, the Nordic countries, and one answer to that would be that, yes, we need to, to recruit mm. Mm. Diverse uh, to 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 uh, uh, diverse to recruit di diversely, and, th and that is uh, and having this attention also to the Nordic mm. uh, researchers will could probably also help uh, to to have stronger recruitment mm. uh, from 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 the Nordic countries mm. to our career paths. I would also, could, could I just yeah. add an, an, another point that I would like to stress, because as a university rector, it's, it's a very easy pedagogical and clear and important point to state that uh, there are always uh, this, there are always challenges going on, it's challenges today, and we don't know the challenges of tomorrow. That's why we need the humanities, we need Russian, we need, oh, what, what do I know? But it's also important to state the importance of knowledge in itself. 
Mm. Uh, and not forget that, okay, it is important. It's, it enriches our societies, our lives, etc. Mm. And, that, and that's also something that we should cherish and, or, and not be afraid of defending as, uh, as researchers and institutions. Mm. Uh, but then we <coughs> dive into the third question here because we're talking about career plans uh, and how to, to pursue a career plan in the Nordics. But we, when I listened to Ola Bortmo and I also talked briefly with him yesterday and I also said that, okay, uh, the years to come, it's probably, it will be less discussion about money because the money won't be there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, if we, I mean, that's, what not he, that's not what he said exactly, but I heard what he said and, uh, and and he said but, but what we will be talking about is the human capital and how to use the human capital in a better way as well and we are now talking about uh, uh, numbers we talk about how many PhD students we have now if we c compare it to just 10 years back 20 years back and all of them cannot end up in a university that's for sure uh, but how, what roles do higher education institutions play in preparing young SSH researchers for the na Nordic labor markets? Uh, I, can, I can start with now the Research Council. Yeah, yeah I, I think also this strategy is very good. And uh, in fact, we have done something uh, the last many years, in fact, on telling the society that uh, research education, being a PhD, is relevant for many parts of the society. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, uh, we have schemes on uh, what's called industrial uh, PhDs, where a, a business partner mm -hmm. pays three-fourths of, uh, three-quarter of the PhD. And now we have also a public sector PhD, mm -hmm. where, uh, no, it's half and half, half and half, yes. And, that is to introduce, that is not to get more PhDs, mm. but it is to increase the capacity for understanding research mm. and innovation in public sector and in businesses. And that will also create a, a labor market mm. for uh, well-educated researchers. Mm. So I think this uh, integration and mobility, not only in the Nord uh, geographically, mm. but uh, between sectors, will make it uh, a better life mm -hmm. to, be, uh, to take a, a, an education and be a researcher on your own because you can do it many, many places as a researcher, as you have in many mm -hmm. businesses, or as a research competent person who can interpret the research and use it in the, uh, whatever it is, uh, 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 public uh, uh, service or in a, a business development or something like that. Yeah, but, uh, but there is still, I mean, we are kind of immature in the Nordics. And I mean, of course, I know the Nor Norwegian labor market the best. Uh, and then, of course, the Swedish and Danish. Um, I'm not so familiar with the Finnish yet. But uh, I mean, I know one person who was a philosopher who ended up uh, working with an oil company. Uh, and that is kind of the, the odd man out. Uh, while you, if you go to, for instance, Great Britain, it's not very great any longer, but still, if you <laughs> go over there to the West, uh, then you can, I mean, if you, it's, it's quite normal for a person with a humanities background to start working in a bank, for instance. Mm. Uh, and why is it that we still think in the labor market in, in Norway that we need to be specialized uh, with a bank system to work in a bank, just to use an example? Mm. What do you think? No, uh, I think uh, you're right. I think science has a much higher, uh, <laughs> it's very much higher um, valued in other countries than Norway. And uh, when you talk about cultural heritage, of course, Europe has a lot of nations which are more based on culture or more interested in culture and so on. And that, is, uh, even, that could be a study in itself. Why is it so? So I think we should, um, we should talk about this. We should explain why it is necessary to do all this kind of basic research, of course. Uh, and I think, I don't think it is kind of... Um, antagonism with uh, the other uh, fields of research. It's more like meeting each other, mm. uh, go the way. And I think all, also the people from uh, humanities 
have to go a, a little part of the way to meet the engineers and uh, hmm. and even the economists, uh, even many. Even in, the economists, e no, you hear even, that? <laughs> even, even many in social science. It, yeah. It's not uh, like, uh, it, it's a huge uh, diversity within uh, SSH mm -hmm. as we talk it. Yeah, no, I very much like that you addressed this point because it was something that I wanted to, to actually address in this panel because I think it's really important that the institutions of higher education in Nordic countries promote an idea of more flexible career paths. And, and um, yeah, I think the decree one has is really decisive, decisive because much, much can be learned in, in practice. And this is also, if I think of the situation in Central Europe and the UK, it's very common that you have a decree in theology or arts and then you end up being uh, employed by a bank, bank yeah. or, or private company. And, and yeah, somehow the Nordic countries are not flexible in this way and they're not ready to, to take the mm. step, like to, to acknowledge that yes, you have critical skills that you have learned to think and then the rest you can learn at work. Mm. So, so PhDs are maybe employable by public and third sectors um, to, to some extent, but then not in the same way in the, in the private. So we somehow have to, to communicate that. Um, and also, I mean, how to do it. So, so I guess the, the institution should, should be somehow able to communicate the, the usefulness of, of our decrees, that even if education, say, in humanities is not directly aimed at a specific yeah, concrete skill, it still, still um, yeah, equips you with many transferable skills in critical thinking and communication, and, and then the rest you learn mm -hmm. when you get the job. And then the final, final thing I, I thought I should uh, mention here is also maybe worth uh, considering whether, whether um, yeah, at least to, to increase mobility within Nordic countries in the academia, to whether it would make sense to create somehow more unified career paths mm. to increase mobility in the academic job market. So if I compare the situation in Nordic countries, for instance, to North America, where they have a very clear tenure track system mm. and all universities follow the same system, uh, everyone knows what you are expected to deliver and achieve at certain point of your career. Mm. Um, so it makes mobility very easy. Mm. But but, but here in Nordic countries, we have five tiny countries and everyone has a little bit different type of uh, academic uh, uh, career path mm. and how it goes and, and what the titles and what, what you should do to, to get to a certain mm. uh, uh, um, uh, stage or, or to, to acquire a certain title. So I think all this serves to, to um, uh, yeah, it, as a, it hinders mobility in Nordic uh, labor market that, that within such small area we have uh, so much variety yeah. in comparison with the, say, uh, North America. Would it be possible to harmonize uh, the models, Margaret, of the career paths? Mm, the Nordic a good question. Of course it would be possible, but... Uh, <laughs> Would it be, uh, it would be, I don't think that we are that different um, when it comes, yeah. Do you have maybe yeah, if, I, yeah. if I clarify, so maybe in the you know, old times there was a, you know, PhD students, then there was a lector, then there was mm, yes. professor. Mm. But now in recent years, different Nordic countries have started to go to a little bit like tenure track system. Some have assistant, associate full, some have just associate or full. And then also what would you need to achieve at, at different point? It's different. Some, some ha don't have a tenure track system. Mm. So, so, so this is what I meant yeah. with the, yeah. Mm. It will be possible, but I think, yeah, to a to certain extent, it's interesting. And I think that we also, and, and uh, the, the different uh, ministers, they always tend to look to Denmark, for mm. example, when they <laughs> initiate, and that's something that makes us somehow nervous sometimes, <laughs> that they look to <laughs> Denmark for new, uh, to, to try out the new things. But, um, uh, so, so there is a lot of inspiration and also uh, an, an academic culture that we share, but there are also, of course, huge differences. Mm. Like in Norway, we have when you have a, a, a fixed position within the university, in most of the university, you have the same amount of time to, to research as you do to, to teaching, which is... It, it's great, really, mm -hmm. uh, um, which does, which uh, enables us also to support mm. this basic, stable, uh, curiosity-driven, or if you might also, uh, yeah, the, the development of mm. new methodologies and theories within uh, uh, the universities. When, uh, while in Sweden, uh, the situation is slightly different mm. when it comes to, yeah, uh, how 
big part of your position is dedicated to research and mm -hmm. uh, and of course uh, so so uh, but yes. if if it's shown if if it's easy to show that uh, uh, the the different practices of uh, career paths actually is a big obstacle for more mobility between the Nordics. Would that be an argument to put on the table to say, okay, we need to do something, we need to work on this? Mm. Because it gains, or is it that we are so individualistic that uh, Bergen University, we need to do it our way and this is our way and we will always do it this way? I'm not sure that that is the case, that that is the <laughs> biggest mm. obstacle among us. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, maybe there are, yeah, different way of... Yeah, working mm. is true. Um, yeah, the career center. Uh, do you have any plans to expand that or to 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 show it to other parts of of the Nordics and say that this is the model you can you can get it for free. This is how we did this. Uh, actually, uh, we uh, were inspired by other Nordic universities. Yeah. I think they went also to visit Aarhus University. I think you had a, a career center at Aarhus. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, even if we are the first, we are the first in Norway. We're yeah. not the first among the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. So probably other, also other university will set up uh, something like that. I would like also to add to to, to what you said is that um, I think also that we should enable and train our PhD and uh, postdoc scholars in mm -hmm. also. Um, advocating for their own skills and to be more uh, braving selling themselves mm. uh, outside uh, uh, the university so but unfortunately uh, unfortunately there are there is very little unemployment mm. almost none even also among the phd mm. scholars in the humanities so that's uh, still not the case but the the alternative uh, career paths that we were talking about how much is that part of the thinking in the career centers? Um, in our career center, um, I think it is definitely a big part of it, mm. yes. And we also try to, uh, to um, scrutinize and, and understand the region of Bergen, mm. because we are not the only higher education mm. <laughs> Uh, institution in Bergen, and we also have a, a, a quite a big sector of, of in institutes. Mm. So, uh, and yes, and, and they also set up a meeting with the mm. public sector, and uh, yeah, so it's a big part of it. I want to end with a story from yesterday. If you do, you have something that we really want to throw into this uh, panel before it's uh, wrapping up? Yeah, I, I think uh, the discussion about when will the challenge occur and when will people uh, yeah. uh, discover it. I think we have challenges is a lot of things. Some challenges is far in the future, mm. and of course you have to have mm. a broad research on everything, mm. always. Mm. Some uh, some challenges researchers Here. can see. Mm. But other, other people don't see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, we started research on the migration and on so, uh, societal uh, security five years before it was yeah. on the political agenda. Mm. And only in those five years, and this was w with great contributions mm. from humanities, mm. we were more prepared. Mm. And some challenges would stay on for many years, mm. like the climate change. Mm. They are rather persistent. Mm. So. And at the same time, we see from medicine that it's shorter and shorter between basic science and applied mm. science and, and innovations. Mm. So I think um, that uh, my hope is that we don't have to defend so mm. much mm. humanities. Mm. We could rather go the other way and say, well, this is very good yeah. and maybe not interesting for all, mm. but we can, in addition to that, mm. do, do a lot on the topics which will come now mm. or tomorrow or in the 30s, the mm. 2030s. And I have to admit that yesterday at the dinner, it was a really a great dinner at Håkonsalen, I, w I sat next to a person, <coughs> you probably will know who this is when I uh, uh, reveal this, who she trained as a lumberjack ending up as a philosopher. Uh, and 
I, that made me think, of course, about how we look upon humanities because we don't see that happening, that you can chop woods in the... In, I mean, you go into the forest and use your handcraft and then study Kant the minute after. But you gave me the perfect ending of that story. Yeah, no, it, it, just, it just resonated with um, yeah the work that I've been doing myself. So of course today when we think of philosophy, we're thinking of some kind of yeah purely academic discipline uh, based on, on cognitive skills. But then the ancient sources with which I have been um, studying, so so they have much broader idea of philosophy as a, as a way of life and. We also have some, some accounts of, of communities of, of uh, philosophers where, for instance, manual labor and, and philosophy are not separated yeah. from yeah. each other, but they are seen as different aspects of the, of the same philosophical yeah. uh, way of life. So, so I think yeah, there is a much more, more holistic um, understanding of, of what, say, mm -hmm. a philosophical way of mm -hmm. life is uh, around the, the turn of the era and, and yeah, before mm -hmm. and after it. So, so, so yeah. And being a, uh, the daughter of a lumberjack, I of course love that story. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much uh, for participating on this uh, panel. Mm. And I know that Charsti will now come up to wrap it all up. Charsti Flottum, please, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilde, um, for, your, for letting me say some words. I will be short. Uh, but thank you also, Hilde, for all those well-grounded and uh, excellent sharing of, this, um, uh, of the presentation, the debates, uh, through this entire seminar. And in my view, well, I cannot wrap up, but there has been so many new perspectives to take further on. Uh, and in my view, the seminar has really managed in a most interesting way to highlight a number of various experiences and perspectives on research in the humanities and social sciences within the Nordic countries. In particular, I think it has conveyed the importance of support for young researchers, and especially institutional support, I think. Uh, but then also what has been said and what is very important, I think, is that there is a lot more to exploit when it comes to Nordic collaboration in different ways. There are many important points that have been brought up and that will inspire further thinking and action on young researchers' possibilities as well as challenges now and in the future. And as chair of the Holberg Board, um, it has, throughout the, whole, the Holberg Week, it has been particularly interesting to see how important the Nils Klim Prize for young researchers has been, is, and will continue to be, I think. And today, exemplified by several Nils Klim laureates, it has been a great pleasure to listen to you all with your important points. So I would like to extend my thanks to everyone who has contributed to making this seminar into such an interesting exchange. And this also in includes, of course, the, the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, the Research Council of Norway, uh, Young Acad Academy of Norway, uh, and also the Minister, of course, uh, Ulla Borten Mo, who, in fact, early on approached the Holberg Prize about the possibility of organizing such a seminar and the Ministry, thank you, for taking an active part in organizing this event. Thank you also, she just left, but Margot, thank you. <laughs> thank you to the Rector uh, for having hosted this event in collaboration with the Holberg Prize and the Ministry. And uh, now, most importantly again, I would extend my thanks to all the participants, to the audience, and to the moderator, Hilde Sandvik, who has done an excellent job, I think, elegantly navigating between questions, different Nordic countries, different contexts, and so on, as you do every Sunday morning. <laughs> Finally, I have to mention 
that this event marks the end of the Holberg Week in Bergen. There is more to come that I will say something about in a minute. Now, but this is the first time um, in three long years that we had a physical format of the Holberg Week and with some audacity, but without any blush today, I would say that it has been quite successful. Due to the participation, of course, of a number of excellent scholars in various contexts, and not least due to the efforts of the whole, the entire Holberg Secretariat. We have had a record number of events this year for both the academic community and beyond. But the event that concludes the whole, the entire Holberg Week will take place in Oslo at the House of Literature there this evening in the form of a conversation between Holberg laureate Sheila Jasanoff and Professor Katrina Holst from the University of Oslo. And the conversation will focus on the topic expertise, democracy and the politics of trust. It starts at six o'clock. You have the time to go to Oslo, but most importantly, it will be live streamed on the Holberg Prize website. And now, by thanking you all again, I hope to see you next year in Bergen. So welcome to the Holberg Week 2023, also marking the 20th, 20th anniversary of the Holberg Prize that we will celebrate. Hoping to see you again, and thank you.